Bienvenidas sean todas y todos. Mi nombre es Andrea Villers, soy parte de Aura, la organización que está a cargo del programa cultural del Foro Generación Igualdad. Tengo el placer de presentar este panel que lleva como título Palabras que empoderan, una perspectiva feminista de la literatura. Nos acompañan destacadas escritoras de distintos países, generaciones y con acercamientos diversos a la literatura. Agradecemos la, particip la participación de todas en esta conversación que estamos seguras que será muy inspiradora. Como moderadora contamos con la presencia de Gloria J. Brown Marshall, a quien presentaré para después cederle el micrófono y dar inicio a esta charla. Gloria J. Brown Marshall es autora de diversos libros, incluido She Took Justice, The Black Woman, Law and Power. Es profesora de Derecho Constitucional en el John Jay College y corresponsal legal que cubre la Suprema Corte de los Estados Unidos y las Naciones Unidas. La profesora Brown Marshall ha hablado en muchos canales de televisión y otras plataformas en Estados Unidos, Londres, Ginebra, Johannesburgo, París, Toronto y Luanda. Sobre cuestiones de justicia social, justicia racial y equidad de género. Gloria es abogada de derechos civiles y dramaturga. Su obra de teatro más reciente sobre la justicia social es Dreams of Emmett Steele. Thank you very much, Gloria. Thank you. I'm so honored to be here with these women who have done so much for literature. And as we speak to the feminist writer, we wonder then um, what is it that has her voice as such a strong feminist voice and what part of her writing speaks to that voice. And so we begin with Helen Benedict and Helen Benedict is a professor. She's also a writer of several novels but her focus is on injustice and her latest project focuses on refugees, especially those in Greece. Helen Benedict, would you please speak to your feminist writer's voice and then share with us an excerpt from your, write, your writing and your work? Sure, thank you very much. I would say that my feminist voice grew like so many feminist voices out of outrage outrage at the injustice at the way so many women are treated around the world and the way so many are, are silenced. And um, I wanted to fight against that ever since I was small. So it's, it took me through work with, um, with victims of violence, but then to war and lately to refugees, um, to break out of the victim roles and, and look at the strengths of women and celebrate the strength of women. So I'll read a little bit from my forthcoming novel called The Good Deed, which is set, set in a refugee camp in Greece. And this is in the voice of Amina, who's a 19-year-old Syrian. And she's just started a class in English with women from five other countries. Speaking in our various levels of English, we talk of how last night's storm poured so much rain on us for so long that many of our tents on the mountainside were washed into the valley, taking our few precious belongings with them, while mattresses floated about like boats in the mud. We also talk of what our seasons are like in our home countries compared to those in Greece but we do not ask after one another's families or children in case they are dead. And we do not talk of our stories for we are strangers to one another and thus wary. Instead, we compare various sayings in our home languages as an exercise in translation. I'll begin with a few English ones to give you the idea, the teacher Lily says, dry as a bone, poor as a church mouse. This last one baffles us, so she tries to explain but only the Congolese woman with the Christian cross around her neck seems to grasp the meaning. Snug as a bug, Lily offers next. We pause, scratching our rashes. A plague of scabies has swept through the camp lately, joining the bedbugs and mosquitoes. In return, we come up with sayings of our own. A fool's tongue is long enough to cut his own throat. Mm. A, a tree oft transplanted will never prosper. A drowning man will grab even onto a snake. Speaking of snakes, one slithered into my tent during the storm last night, the Congolese woman remarks. It was chasing a rat. 
and out of nowhere, we are laughing. We laugh loud and long and helplessly until we are wiping our eyes and gasping. We laugh at misery, at snakes and rats and rain and mud, at bedbugs and scabies, at statelessness and loss. Even as we know, our tears are not those of true laughter, but of the sorrow pressing against the thin casings of our skins. Mm. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And as we go through, you'll see all of our attendees, just how magnificent each one of these feminist writers are. So Priya Malhotra is going to be next. And Priya questions societies and definition of women, definition of femininity and womanhood. Her works speak to this deep longing and her selection, Shape of Dreams, um, follows a young mother whose son is murdered as she in her neighborhood deals with the aftermath of the violence. Speak to us, Priya, about the feminist writer's voice and your selection. Um, I've always been interested in issues of gender. It's something that's always fascinated um, me in, when I was in, um, in when I was in college, I, you know, explored Victorian womanhood because I grew up in India, and you know we had a very Victorian sensibility. Um, when I was doing graduate, when I was in graduate school, I um, wrote about American women converting to Islam, for um, because I was very curious about why people would why women would do this um, from a gender perspective. And that led me to my novel, which I'm going to, you know, um, read an uh, excerpt for you, um, for you from, um, which is about middle-aged women who often, women who find themselves becoming very invisible at that particular age. And uh, people seem to think women always want marriage and, you know, things like that. And, you know, here I'm trying to, you know, counter that by in, in the voice of my character, Nana, uh, and this is just after her boyfriend and has proposed to her. Now the woman is in her mid, uh, is in her mid fifties. So I'm going to start reading from, this is from my upcoming novel, A Woman of an Uncertain Age. That night, Nana lay tossing and turning as Faisal slept, glad it was their last night together and that tomorrow night she would be ensconced in her, in her quandary, in her own nest. She was vexed and confused, surprised by the size and intensity of her own reaction. She didn't want to get married, not now, not ever, not to Faisal, not to anyone. The thought of living with anyone made her cringe, made her frightened, made her fiercely protective of everything that was hers. All the things in her own little life, small or big, now glowed in her imagination, like fragile tw twinkling pleasures in danger of being snuffed out. She liked sprawling on her bed, her big queen size bed, diagonally with her legs on the right side and her head on the left side. For the three or four nights, she slept alone. She liked reading alone late into the night with her bright bedside lamp on. She liked being the sole owner of her own apartment. She liked her mailbox, mailbox <laughs> containing no one else's mail except hers. She liked the, watching the travel channel by herself without arguing about it with anyone. She liked ordering in Chinese food without being told which dishes could be prepared in the same amount of time it took for delivery that were much healthier and tastier. She liked spreading her bath and body products all over her tub without being questioned why, about why she needed so many products. She liked eating a, a jar from the jar with a spoon and then using the same spoon to put a jar on her plate. She liked coming home to utter silence. She liked not having to always see someone every time she came home, to always feel the weight of their presence fill up, fill up the empty space in, in the apartment. She liked evenings when, when she, where she didn't have to figure out why the other person was silent or sullen. She likes sometimes retreating into herself without having to explain or defend herself. But most of all, she liked being in a space where the tentacles of no one else's needs could reach and prey upon her. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, as we see, we're being introduced to such um, wonderful writing 
as well as insights into the feminist writer and a woman's life. And next we have uh, Brenda Myers Powell. And Brenda speaks to the, the woman as a doorway to life and not just a doormat in life. And as a feminist writer, how does that philosophy play out um, in your viewpoint as well as in your writing? Thank you so much. Um, for many years, for about uh, 40 years in my life, I was the doormat in my own life, um, being a survivor of human trafficking and being raised to be told to be the doormat um, for men. And when I found my voice late in my life, it was very, um, it was accidental, but it was on purpose. So when I found my life, when I found my voice, it was um, very important that I make a point of delivering it to other women to know, to let them know that there was a voice to be had. And one of the things that inspired me was when I found out that my daughter was pregnant with my granddaughter. And I remember telling her that I will be a much better grandmother than I ever was a mom because I had a granddaughter coming in. And I remember my grandmother doing something for me that I didn't realize that she had did. She gave me stories of strength. She gave me stories of ancestry. She gave me stories to make me feel there was a foundation for me. And I wanted to give my granddaughter stories of strength. So I had to start my life over with purpose so that I can give this grandchild stories of strength and stories that she could stand on. Not the stories that I had, because I only had stories of being torn down by men and beaten down and being walked on like a doormat. So I needed new stories to tell that my voice mattered. So with that said, Sunia and I became like 98 and two, like Jack and Jill. It was because of him that I started asking the big questions. And I started to feel a woman in prostitution don't have a voice. Who is speaking out for women, speaking up for women? Having a voice is a hell of a thing. A lot of people don't. So other people have to speak for them. In the next week or two, I was speaking in front of state senators. I didn't receive any training. I had never done it before, but I wasn't nervous. I just thought, okay, here's my chance to say what needs to be said. Nobody was going to tell these folks the truth. Let me say something to you, you sons of bitches. <laughs> that was in my mind. And I felt that's what I was going, that's what I was doing. I was speaking for girls who didn't have an opportunity to speak for themselves. I had to be careful about what I said, but I also needed to say what had to be said. I had to speak for countless women who died out there, who had been harmed and who had never been able to speak. The first time I ever spoke, I was talking about how the courts were, were giving out felonies to women who were prostituting. The felony upgrades were, were not helping the situation. They weren't fair. I told those senators to notice. They weren't doing that to the Johns. Nobody was going after the pimps. And they were only doing it in the areas where gentrification, like Bucktown. They worked Bucktown back in the day. They put up the million dollar condos. The residents had started showing up at court, calling the state senators and the congressmen and all that to make sure the women didn't return to the neighborhood. But you know, even after the prostitutes had left the block, the tricks were still there and the tricks were actually soliciting the women residents. Now somebody tell me what all that situation had to do with the hoes on the stroll. Goes to show you that the problem were the Johns, throwing the book at the prostitute wasn't going to stop the situation. I had become the voice and the face of prostitution. What they now call human trafficking, I had to take the role on. And if I was going to 
going to be that girl, I had to make sure that it was okay with my loved ones. I talked to those senators first, and then I realized, oh, man, I got to talk to my kids. My daughters had a long conversation about it. I asked them, how do you feel about it? Mama, that's your story. You tell your story, especially if you are helping other people with it. Go tell your story. You have to consider the people close to close to you when you put, your, you put yourself out there. Being known as a former prostitute, Brenda Myers Powell, I had permission from the people who really mattered, my daughters. They have supported me totally through this whole journey because they wanted me to heal. And if they wanted me to help other people heal, then that's what my girls wanted me to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, April Reynolds. Um, we have an April Reynolds, um, a black woman writer, a woman who is a feminist writer, but speaks for and uh, speaks to the black woman, writes to her and thinks with the mind of what she needs. April Reynolds, please share with us your feminist writer's mind, that black woman's mind, the mixture of the two and the excerpt that you're going to read. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just wanna say, why did I have to follow Brenda? This is just so unfair. Uh, uh, I, so I want to talk about like how in finding my feminist voice for me was simultaneously finding my writer's voice. Uh, and like Brenda, um, that for me is about telling stories and the stories women tell themselves, how we, stories we tell to get through, to get by, to get over, stories of sort of triumph, stories of tragedy and understanding no matter what the story, um, they are all of worth uh, and that they should be told. So with that in mind, um, I'm reading an excerpt from my forthcoming novel, The Shape of Dreams. And it follows a young mother um, whose son is murdered and she and her neighborhood are dealing with the aftermath of that violence. So, <clears throat> secrets are funny. Some are passed along as soon as they are told, while others find a dark cave and stay there. No one talks of the bliss. White folks cluck, the churches tisk, black people shake their heads, but nobody tells about the bliss. Not the sort that awaits in another life, but bliss right now. Bliss easily gained, like walking through a door, puff, bone-colored smoke, and then fathers are set free from jail, Mothers are noted and loved. Sisters are supported and surrounded by twinkling lights. And when scores and scores of brown brothers are carted away by the police, it is by the elbow, accompanied by a gentle cooing in the ear. Come back soon. We won't forget you. There's a reason it's named crack. Every problem, every hurt tumbles into it. And spellbound, two women watch their pain fall into an abyss. Crack's chasm is so deep, they never hear their hurts thud hit bottom. With the bliss came the talk about their mothers and their sons and their jobs. Oh, the jobs. Oh, God, can you believe we worked that hard? And their lovers. Where is Tony? I don't know. Their talk is both pointed and profound. Giggles punctuate. For both women, these are the best conversations they have ever had. One and two. And somehow that's, that's funny. So funny. Wanda stands up on tiptoe and Anita joins her. I bet you money that's what Carl was thinking when he seen both of us that day. What day? The day we went looking. Wanda comes down from tiptoe and tries to focus on her friend. You Rosa Parks and I'm the other one. One and two. See what I mean? No. And Anita's answer is hilarious. They are standing in Anita's living room. Stomachs are clutched, hands reach for foreheads. No, huh? Well, yes, I mean, no. Anita loses her balance and collapses onto the couch. Dust agitates and rises. Somebody needs to hoover. Me? The thought makes Anita laugh again. Okay, listen, seriously, listen. 
my grandmother was talking to me one time and she said, what'd she say? Oh girl, I forgot. But, but Wanda hadn't forgotten it, for hadn't forgotten at all. She just can't remember the words in which to say it. No, no, wait, I remember. The blank spot of, spot of forgetfulness is shoved aside and Wanda tells Anita a story she thinks may be apocryphal, but believes anyway, because her grandmother is not a liar. Back in the day, when all the trouble black people were in was because white folks kept fucking with them. A bunch of black dudes decided to do something about it. And then a lady came to them and she told them how she had to sit in the back of the bus. And how fucked was that? Them dudes decided to do something about it, take it to the courts, maybe get all the blacks to rally around it. Okay. But then they went looking to make sure she was cool and they found out she wasn't. Like she was like divorced and had some other shady shit going on. So they dropped her, but the idea stayed and they found Rosa Parks who was perfect and everything a black woman wanted to be. What was the other woman's name? I don't know. Wait, wait, who's Rosa Parks? You! And that starts another peal of laughter. Wanda beats the couch. She finds it so funny. And Anita, thinking about her dead husband and son, finds it funnier. The laughter dies a little, but stutters here and there when, it, when Anita asks a question on her mind. Okay, what's the point of that story again? I'm just saying, when bad stuff happens to us, first, it's got to be real bad. And second, it's got to happen to somebody that's the same. And third, but her thoughts dribble off and Wanda can't think of a third. It doesn't matter. Anita is there to feed her. She's a pro now and tips the pipe into Wanda's mouth. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Kalisha Buchanan mixes fiction as well as nonfiction as a journalist the background in which you've written in so many different areas, especially following the courts. So in this writer's feminism, in this point of place in which you now think about um, the, the challenges you face and the challenges women face and you as a feminist writer, speak to the celebration though of African-American people. You mix those two things. And as you speak to us about your feminist writer's voice, also the excerpt that you have for us speaks to it as well. Tell us about um, your feminist voice. Thank you so much, Gloria, for that beautiful introduction and, I'm, and everybody who's here and who put this together and that I'm reading with and everyone who's, who's coming. Thank you guys so much. Um, I do celebrate African-American life because I, I think um, we have racism, you know, we have the things that um, whites, Europe, colonialism, whatever you want to call that has uh, done. But at the end of the day, we have black people and there's so much rich and beautiful and wonderful to celebrate about black people in America. Um, and that's what how I became feminist. I, I guess I was feminist before I knew the word. Um, I was raised by black women. We definitely had our men there, um, strong, beautiful women who were proud of who they were and um, passed that on to me. And I've never wanted to be anything other than what I am. And I got that, which I think is, is what the goal of feminism should be, is that we should feel, women should feel protected and wanting to be who we are and not wanting to be something different because of what's happened to us. And so I did get that um, really from where I come from, small town, Illinois. So what I'm reading is from my latest book, Speaking of Summer, and this particular excerpt deals with a woman looking for her sister. Um, she lives in Harlem, she's a black woman, and her twin sister is up and disappeared. This particular excerpt is about her thoughts on that, and um, it really covers something black people and people of color and women know about being gone and missing, whether these were Africans kidnapped from uh, Africa to come be slaves, 
slaves who disappeared to come to the North, um, girls and women who are getting trafficked, um, children who are being robbed from their families and kidnapped. This is was my attempt to describe what happens to the people left behind. So Autumn thinks, I had left Summer's fingerprints on her dressing room mirror. I joyfully borrowed her clothes. If I read her journals or notes or emails, I heard her voice saying her old words and I felt better. I washed her scent from her pillowcases, sheets, and comforter eventually. I switched her bedding and moved into her room to feel she was still here. My bedroom, the smaller one facing the brick gangway, never invited the breeze. Now it was just my dressing closet in need of a good sweeping and dusting. The comforter crumpled and twisted at the foot of my Ikea bed. I finally threw out a rank coffee cup with spoiled cream and a saucer of piece of pizza crust on the nightstand. One day I stomped from Summer's bed to smash down my digital alarm clock, automatically set to go at 7 a.m. I arose around noon now, later in rain, her absence clogged my head with memories of our life together, now separated. I just wanted to know she was okay, alive, because without that insurance, my mind produced a steady carousel of conjecture. Each stop was dark, terrifying, and sad. I drifted from most so-called friends. None of them knew what to say. I failed to return calls from back home, not that I received many. I felt betrayed and guilty. I wanted to know what I'd done or what someone else did. I didn't want to intrude on her new life if she'd gone to start over so fresh that I was unwanted. We had after all estranged from our history before the inevitable. Our last parents dying left us no choice but to repair the breaches. With our whole history and origins dwindled, it was possible one more lost person might not add up to much for her. So thank you. Oh. Thank you so much. And uh, Carmen Bellosa is a Mexican feminist writer who is very proud of her heritage, but she questions everything as many women should. And so Carmen, please tell us about your feminist voice. Tell us about your brave perspective in questioning the entire world. And please share with us your work. Gloria, thank you so much, and thank you all. This has been a banquet, really a feminist banquet. I'm so happy to be with you all, Helen, Priya, Brenda, April, Kalisha, and Marjorie, that we is about to read too, um, and Patricia Cortez that invited us to be here. This is, has been wonderful. I um, started writing as a teen, I loved to read. My father was a wonderful reader. The house was full of books. But uh, when my mother died, uh, in, when I was an early teen, and everything crumbled around me, the family, the father, all the order that I knew, uh, I held to one idea, or I grabbed one fantasy. I was a writer. And it started as a fantasy, as a world I liked from outdoors that has been very generous to me. And that came along simultaneously with something I didn't know was called feminism. I had no idea uh, when it started that it was there, that those were the authors I loved, the women authors I loved. May not, may, most of them were women. I had no idea that was it. Even at the streets of Mexico City, where the second wave of feminism was happening, and very few women were having these incredible fun demonstrations. And it was there. It was part of it. For me, there was not like separate labels. It was a joint adventure a joint adventure where I went from reading this magazine to reading the wave of macho authors of the Latin American literature without really distinguishing as a teen. Uh, it's been a generous life that has been uh, 
given to me out of this uh, first step I took without knowing I was not throwing myself to an abyss, but I was entering a fantastic world as today we have seen here. I'm going to read uh, a, a little passage from a book I published some years ago, uh, some, a collection of small essays called When Mexico Recaptures Texas. And because of the theme of today, I chose this little passage on the female author of the Odyssey, Odyssey and Other Forgotten Ones. Cutting or clipping off other great women from our memory, we mutilate all of us. What about the wife of Edward Hopper? Isn't it nice to have a wife who paints? Asked him one day Josephine, to which he answered, it stinks. There's no way today to see any works by Josephine Hopper. Before she got married to Hopper, she was considered one of the most important artists of her time, having exhibited alongside Picasso, O'Keeffe, and Modigliani. But her relationship with Hopper, whose first show is she arranged and for whose career she worked tirelessly, erased her. So this is something customary. At the end of the 19th century, the erudite Samuel Butler, translator of the Iliad and the Odyssey into good English prose, published the female author of the Odyssey. He concludes on it that the female author was a young, unmarried Sicilian woman, woman who composed the poem by hand between 1000 and 1050 before Christ. How could she have been forgotten? The sophisticated reader Butler explains how and answers any objections this way. It is considered very improbable that a woman of any time period would have been capable of writing a masterpiece like the Odyssey. To this, I answered that it is equally improbable that a man wrote it, and the fact is that no one has ever repeated it. With centuries transpired since the Odyssey was written, no one has been able to equal it. It is also improbable that the son of a wool merchant from Bedfordshire would write Hamlet. Or, may I add, Buyosa, another one, that a provincial ambassador woman could create the genial works of Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz in what we call today Mexico. Phenomenal works imply a phenomenal creator, and there are as many phenomenal women as there are men. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carmen. And we have our, our final uh, feminist writer, um, Marge Reagosin. And so what we need to know and, and, and understand about Marjorie's work is her viewpoint on the world writ large. And Marjorie will share with us um, her feminist writer voice, but also an excerpt from her work. Marjorie. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all my, uh, my sisters, fellow writers. Thank you for Patricia Cortez and uh, for our common agent, Jennifer Lyons. As I heard all of you, and I'm glad I'm going last because my name is always an A, I wanted to tell you that I was always, as a young girl growing up in Chile, interested in the women that were always in the back doing things, like making the fire, taking care of the food, uh, making sure we were ready to uh, to go to school. And to me, these, these were the most interesting people in the household, and they became the most interesting people in the world. They were very quiet, but deep down I knew that they were the protagonists of the world. 
And I do believe that women make the world dance and go around. Uh, as I became an adolescent, I witnessed a tremendous courage of, of women all over Latin America um, fighting for social justice, for human rights, and creating a different kind of politics. And also from my mother, who, who once told me that um, if I put marbles and a little bit of water from the ocean and agates from from the seashore, I would have all the power of nature in my hands. And we need our hands to create beauty, to write, and to empower one another. So I will read a, a small fragment of, um, of my first young adult novel, because I am a poet, but somehow I happen to write a novel. Uh, it's called I Lived in Butterfly Hill, and it's about a young girl named uh, Celeste Marconi, and she has tremendous agency. She moves to the United States uh, to live a life of exile. And finally, she returns home to Chile. So very quickly, uh, this is Celeste speaking. And now it is night, another night in my house on Butterfly Hill. The lights from the harbor shine around the city like a halo. Buenas noches, Nana Delfina. I close the door of the little room filled with cinnamon smoke that wafts into the hallway from below the door. I know the light below the door glows into the wee hours of the night. Slowly, patiently, Delfina is reading Pablo Neruda. Every night when I'm supposed to be asleep, I write in my notebook and practice using the typewriter that our neighbor on Butterfly Hill gave me at my surprise party. At first I was using only two fingers, one from each hand, but now I am up to three and Papa promises that I keep typing away, I soon, I will make it to five. The first letter I typed out, I sent to Kim and Tom, I still don't know where they are. I typed, I typed it out two times in English and put two envelopes in the mailbox. One to Korea and the other, the other one addressed in care of Mr. John Carter, postman, Juliet Cove, Maine. If they ever receive my letter, this is what they will read. So here is the letter. Dear Kim and Tom, it has been so long, but I haven't forgotten you. Neither have I forgotten my promise to send you something I have written. So I have included a poem along with the letter. The poem is called, The Ship Called Hope. I wrote it one night as I sat on my roof and look at the stars. When I remember asking my abuela Frida if she was a refugee, I was five years old and didn't know what the word meant. And her eyes became very big as if they were filled with seawater. And she looked at me for a long time. And then she said, yes, I am a refugee. And it is a beautiful word, a beautiful thing. I am an exile. That means I am a traveler of the world and I belong to nothing but the things I love. We haven't seen each other since that day long ago when we lay in the grass on Juliet Cove, but I still hope to see you soon. Until then, may you both belong to the things you love and I will belong to the things I love. Your forever friend, Celeste Marconi. Thank you. And we have so little time left and so much more to give to the world as women, as writers, as feminist writers. But because we meet challenges, we know that we need inspiration outside of ourselves. And so we only have two minutes apiece to very quickly go through those words that inspire ourselves and we hope will inspire the next generation of feminist 
writers. And so we will begin again with Helen and speak to those inspirational words for ourselves and speaking to that next generation of writers listening that they too will be feminist writers encouraged to go forward. Helen. On mute. The most important thing to remember for any writer, but especially one starting out, is to pay attention to your passions and write out of your passions. But passion is what will feed your work and feed your soul. Whatever makes you passionate, whatever the subject is. Um, I think one of the things that has always inspired me so much is the passion of other writers and also the determination and resilience that I've seen in so many people who, women in particular, who've been through so many difficult things. And um, one of these is uh, the poet Maram <clears throat> al-Mazri, a Syrian poet. And I'm going to read from her book, Liberty Walks Native, uh, Naked, which came out in 2017, just a few short poems. Tell me a story. Tell me a story, demands the child born in a prison to a raped mother. The visitor begins. Once upon a time, there was a young boy who lived in a house with windows looking out on a calm <coughs> street. What is window? The child interrupts. It is a hole in the wall where the sun comes in and where birds perch. What is bird? The child asks. The visitor picks up a pencil and draws on the wall a window and a child with wings. Thank you so much. And Priya, given our short time, just a few sentences about those inspirations for the next generation of feminist writers and the inspirational words you wish to share. Um, I would like to say that uh, I think it's very important, just like Helen said, you know, to be true to your passion. I think that, you know, I think you should follow your passions and, and, and really find your voice and not be, you know, you know, given to what society says or, or, you know, anything else. I think it's very important um, to find your voice. And, you know, if it, it doesn't even have to fit a particular definition of being feminist either. You know, there are many definitions, you know, there are many ways that women can be uh, feminist. So, you know, to being, to live, you know, sort of authentically and write authentically. I think that that is, um, that's the best piece of advice I can give. And uh, somebody who lived a quite an adventurous life of feminist writer that I um, admire, I'd like to read from um, her. Her name is Anais Nin, which I'm sure many writers will be familiar with. So I'm going to um, read a bit from her and I may, skip a couple of packages just to get the passages just to get to the end because I know we're short on time. So thank you. Um, tonight she remembered the new moon baths as if this had marked the beginning of her life instead of the parents' school birthplace, as if they had determined the course of her life rather than inheritance or imitation of the parents. In the moon baths perhaps lay the secret motivation of her act. At 16, Sabina took moon baths, first of all, because everyone else took sun baths. And second, she admitted, because she had been told it was dangerous. The effect of moon baths was unknown, but it was intimated that it might be the opposite effect, of, uh, might be the opposite of the sun's effect. The first time she exposed herself, she was frightened. What would the consequences be? There were many taboos against gazing at the moon, many old legends about the evil effects at the moon, many old legends about falling asleep in moonlight. She knew that the insane found the full moon acutely disturbing, that some of them regressed to animal habits of howling at the moon. She knew that in astrology, the moon ruled the nightlife of the unconscious, invisible to, consci un to consciousness. But then she had always preferred the night to the day. It accentuated her love of mystery. She meditated on this planet, which kept a half of itself in darkness. She felt related to it because it was the planet of lovers. Her attraction for it, her desire to bathe in its rays, explained her repulsion for home, husband, and children. She began to imagine 
She knew the life which took place on the moon. Homeless, childless, free lovers, not even tied to each other. Thank you. Thank you. And Brenda, a few words of inspiration and then your excerpt you would like to read that would inspire the next generation of writers. And remember, we're very short on time. Thank you. I would like to say stay close to your passion and stay close to who you are and what you are. Do not give it up. And I'd like to say something that the person who wrote my book was April Reynolds. So I would say she is my favorite writer um, uh, here. And what a beautiful person, too, because she stayed true to my voice. And that is, I'd like to say that to everyone, but the, the author that I'm reading from is Maya Angelou because it stays close to where I'm coming from about, I know why the cage bird sings because it's all about having a voice and how your voice can be pushed down and no one can hear it and how it's, you know, can be stuffed inside you. And I'm just going to read a little piece because I know that we are, you know, for time sakes, because everybody knows that poem, but I'm going to read the last piece that says, the courage bird sings with a fearful trill that things are known but long for still. And his tune is heard on the distant hill for the cage bird sings for freedom. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. And April Reynolds, your few sentences of inspiration and your excerpt you'd like to read that ins keeps inspiring you. So obviously I'm inspired by other writers. Thank all of you so much for reading your work today. I mean, I'm just feel kind of renewed and ready to go back, go back to it. Uh, I'm reading from Toni Morrison, who is obviously a great inspiration to me. And this is from her talk uh, at Bard. Um, it is in, I don't know if you guys can see this, The Source of Self-Regard. It's called Cinderella's Stepsisters, and I too kind of shortened it down. I want not to ask you, but to tell you not to participate in the oppression of your sisters. Women who stop the promotion of other women in careers are women. And another woman must come to the victim's aid. I am alarmed by the violence that women do to one another, professional violence, competitive violence, emotional violence. I am alarmed by the willingness of women to enslave other women. I am alarmed by a growing absence of decency on the killing floor of professional women's worlds. I am suggesting that we pay as much attention to our nurturing sensibilities as to our ambition. In your rainbow journey toward the realization of your personal goals, don't make choices based only on your security and your safety. Nothing is safe. That is not to say that anything ever was or that anything worth achieving ever should be things of value seldom are. It is not safe to have a child. It is not safe to challenge the status quo. It is not safe to choose work that has not been done before or to do old work in a new way. There will always be someone there to stop you. Women's rights is not only an abstraction, a cause. It is also a personal affair. It is not only about us, it is also about me and you, just the two of us. Thank you. Thank you. And Kalisha Buchanan, we have so little time, but we must hear from you. Please share. Well, I want to tell other women writers out there that there is a place for you. I mean, look at this panel. You see that there is a place for you. You see that like we saw before us, there were other women we looked out in the world and said, I can be her, I can do that. Those women had had those other women against incredible odds. We, we were all here against incredible odds, but each generation or, or era, has made it easier for the next. And so 
basically get on our shoulders, come stand on top of us, you know, <laughs> just come, you know, we're here and you could be next and you will be next just by you being here um, shows you're already on the journey. But um, this book is from a woman named Kim Johnson. It's called This Is My America. I am partial to novels and um, what I, or novelist, including Miss Reynolds. Um, and so what I loved about this was just that we have a place for a black female character in America, a teenager, to be able to have these words printed in a book, even though she's a fictional character. But this writer, Kim Johnson, has put this spirit in a book and these concerns. Friday, April 23rd. Dear Mr. Jones, my dad has precisely 275 days before his execution. You're the only hope we have because every lawyer we've used has failed us. In the last appeal, Judge Williams didn't take more than five minutes to consider. We mailed a renewed application since it's now been seven years. Please look into James Beaumont's application, number 1756. We have all the court and trial files boxed up and ready to go. Thank you for your time, Tracy Beaumont. That's it. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well done. And inspirational words from Carmen Loyosa, the woman who is not just a Mexican writer, but questions the entire world. What inspiration do you have in our last moments together? And these inspiring words from you and the excerpt you'd like to read to inspire the next generation of feminist writers. Carmen. My inspiration today, well, my recommendation on how to inspire yourself today is go to Google and look at what young feminists are showing the words they are printing on the presidential palace of Mexico. They are painting phrases over the presidential palace of Mexico um, because they have a voice and because women are murdered in Mexico, femicide is higher every day, the violence against women is higher every day and they have all reason to complain and they are printing, projecting their lines on the palace of the presidents uh, on the government offices. It's something really that we all have to listen and to watch too. So, and I'm going to read only four lines of one author that was born in 1590 and wrote besides some poems and a play that has been lost, a wonderful, two wonderful, a long collection of novelas uh, about um, um, the women condition and she was the best seller of her time she has been totally almost forgotten by the readers not the males of her of her century but she was Maria de Sayas do remember her and only very few lines of her because men preside over everything they never tell about the evil deeds they do they tell only about the ones done to them. If you think about it, men are really the ones at fault and women go along with them thinking they must be right. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And we have Marjorie. Marjorie, in your, your final moments with us in this gathering that is so beautiful and so warm and filled with such talent, please share your inspirational words for the next generation, the words you have of your heart, but also the words you have from a writer you respect. I'll be brief um, and I follow many of the statements made by my fellow writers. But I like to tell young feminist women uh, to be courageous, uh, to be close to one another, and to believe that the world is still an amazing place and that you will find somewhere in some place of the world a reader that will understand you. Mm -hmm. 
And I will read from a, a beloved writer of mine, and I'm sure of so many, especially in Latin America, Gabriela Mistral, the only woman that so far <laughs> has won the Nobel Prize for Literature in, Latin, in, in, the, Spa in, La in the Spanish speaking world. So uh, very, very few lines, uh, she calls it uh, Decalogo del Artista, Decalogue of the Artist. I will pick two. You shall create beauty, not to excite the senses, but to give sustenance to the soul. And the second one, beauty shall not be an opiate that puts you to sleep, but a strong wine that fires you to action. For if you fail to be a true man or a true woman, you will fail to be an artist. So let us follow Gabriela. Let's write, let's try, and let's not be afraid. Thank you so much. And this has been such an amazing experience. Um, as we come to a close, I'd like to thank Helen Benedict and Priya Matralta, Maholtra, um, Brenda Myers Power, Powell and uh, April Reynolds, Kalisha Buchanan, Carmen Boyosa, and Marjorie Ogosi. And I'd like to thank the um, empowering words, a feminist perspective of literature. Um, this panel has been one that has been um, an honor for me to act as a moderator. And in any way that I've had to cut short the beauty of the words of my feminist writers, um, uh, I, I apologize deeply. And it was an omission of, of time and not a commission of the heart. I'd like to leave this panel with um, giving one quick sentence, one sentence each. What do you have to say for the future of feminist writers? One sentence, and I will be tough on you. One sentence, Helen, one sentence. Feminist writers, Helen, are you on mute? It's our time, we're taking over. Oh, wonderful. Priya, feminist writers, one sentence. Priya, are you on mute? Priya, you're on mute. <laughs> oh, listen to your voice. Wonderful. Brenda, one sentence for the future of feminist writers. Listen to your inner voice. Wonderful. April Reynolds, the future of feminist writers. One sentence. Start writing. Keep writing. Ooh, wonderful. Carmen. Read, recover, and give life to those writers that have been forgotten because they are your future and your voice. Wonderful. And Marjorie. Well, live in the present and embrace the future. Did I forget anyone? April, Alicia. What Helen said, get on board with us. Join us, come along, we're here. Women are running it right now. Come on. Women, women are running it. And, and I, Gloria J. Brown Marshall, and I'd like to leave with the words of Sojourner Truth, a freedom fighter who was enslaved, who lived from 1797 to 1883, did such amazing things. Yes, she said, ain't I a woman? But she also said, if women want more rights than they got, then they need to just take them and not be talking about it. Sojourner <laughs> Truth. Thank you, ladies. Thank you, feminist writers. Thank you so much for this great opportunity and this great panel. And I leave you now at this moment to go forward and conquer.